Hello everyone, Dane here, and uh, today I'm going to be making a start on my review of Born a Crime by Trevor Noah. Um, so this is, well, Born a Crime and Other Stories to be more precise. This is kind of Trevor Noah's memoir. Um, I, I guess they are basically sort of all little stories in their own right that are then linked with this overall theme of like racism and growing up in um, apartheid Af uh, South Africa when he was literally born a crime. Uh, I'll read you the blurb and then we're going to go through and look at some of my uh, tabs. Trevor Noah's path from apartheid South Africa to the desk of The Daily Show in New York began with a criminal act, his birth. Trevor was born to a white Swiss father and a black Zosa mother at the time when such a union was punishable by five years in prison. Born a Crime is the story of a mischievous young boy who grows into a restless young man as he struggles to find himself in a world where he was never supposed to exist. It is also the story of his relationship with his fearless, rebellious and fervently religious mother. His teammate, a woman determined to save her son from the cycle of poverty, violence and abuse that would ultimately threaten her own life. The 18 personal essays collected here are by turns hilarious, dramatic and deeply affecting. Whether being thrown from a moving car during an attempted kidnapping, or simply trying to survive the life and death pitfalls of dating in high school, Trevor illuminates his world with an incisive wit and an unflinching honesty. So he says here, he says, uh, My mum had this ancient, broken down, bright tangerine Volkswagen Beetle that she picked up for next to nothing. The reason she got it for next to nothing was because it was always breaking down. To this day I hate second-hand cars. Almost everything that's ever gone wrong in my life I can trace back to a second-hand car. Second-hand cars made me get detention for being late for school. Second-hand cars left us hitchhiking on the side of the freeway. A second-hand car was also the reason my mum got married. If it hadn't been for the beetle that didn't work, we would never have looked for the mechanic who became the husband, who became the stepfather, who became the man who tortured us for years and, pull up bullet, and put a bullet in the back of my mother's head. I'll take the new car with the warranty every time. So he says here, I come from a country where people are more likely to visit sangomas, traditional healers, pejoratively known as witch doctors, than they are to visit doctors of western medicine. I come from a country where people have been arrested and tried for witchcraft, in a court of law. I'm not talking about the 1700s, I'm talking about five years ago. I remember a man being on trial for striking another person with lightning. That happens a lot in the homelands. There are no tall, there are no tall buildings, few tall trees, nothing between you and the sky, so people get hit by lightning all the time. And when someone is killed by lightning, everyone knows it's because somebody used Mother Nature to take out a hit. So if you had a beef with the guy who got killed, someone will accuse you of murder and the police will come knocking. Mr. Noah, you've been accused of murder. You used witchcraft to kill David Kibuka by causing him to be struck by lightning. What is the evidence? The evidence is that David Kibuka got struck by lightning and it wasn't even raining. And um, there's a couple of little bits here. I like this reference to Game of Thrones, um, but also it's quite some quite telling quotes here. Temperance lived with his second family in Meadowlands, and we visited them sparingly because my mum was always afraid of being poisoned, which was a thing that would happen. The first family were the heirs, so there was always the chance they might get poisoned by the second family. It was like Game of Thrones with poor people. We'd go into that house and my mum would warn me, Trevor, don't eat the food. But I'm starving. No, they might poison us. Okay, then why don't I just pray to Jesus, and Jesus will take the poison out of the food? Trevor, son Quella. So I only saw my grandfather now and then, and when he was gone the house was in the hands of women. In addition to my mum there was my aunt Sibongile. She and her first husband, Dinky, had two kids, my cousins Mlungusi and Balelwa. Sibongile was a powerhouse, a strong woman in every sense, big-chested, the mother hen. Dinky, as his name implies, was Dinky. He was a small man. He was abusive, but not really. It was more like he tried to be abusive, but he wasn't very good at it. He was trying to live up to this image of what he thought a husband should be, dominant, controlling. I remember being told as a child, if you don't hit your woman, you don't love her. That was the talk you'd hear from men in bars and in the streets. He's talking about Soweto and he says, In America the dream is to make it out of the ghetto. In Soweto, because there is no leaving the ghetto, the dream was to transform the ghetto. And then there's the time when he took a shit in a... In, well, basically he took a shit in the kitchen and put it in the bin and then um, his family thought there was a demon in the house because of it. So we get this. She took my hand and dragged me out of bed. It was all hands on deck, time for action. The first thing we had to do was go outside and burn the shit. That's what you do with witchcraft. The only, way to the only way to destroy it is to burn the physical thing. We went out to the yard and my mum put the newspaper with my little turd on the driveway, lit a match and set it on fire. Then my mum and my grand stood around the burning shit, praying and singing songs of praise. The commotion didn't stop there. Because when there's a demon around, the whole community has to join together to drive it out. If you're not part of the prayer, the demon might leave our house and go to your house and curse you. So we needed everyone. The alarm was raised. The call went out. 
My tiny old gran was out the gate going around the neighborhood, calling to all the other old grannies for an emergency prayer meeting. Come, we've been bewitched. And then he feels, basically his family get him to pray to God that the demon will get killed. And he, he's feeling uncomfortable because obviously he knows that it was him. And he doesn't want to pray to God. And then he, he then gets killed because of that, you know. Uh, the start of chapter four, he says, one afternoon I was playing with my cousins. I was a doctor and they were my patients. I was operating on my cousin Belal's ear with a set of matches when I, accidentally perf when I accidentally perforated her eardrum. All hell broke loose. My grandfather came running in from the kitchen. Grenzeka Natoni, what's happening? There was blood coming out of my cousin's head. We were all crying. My grandmother patched up Belal's ear and my grandmother patched up Belal's ear and made sure to stop the bleeding. But we kept crying because clearly we'd done something we were not supposed to do, and we knew we were going to be punished. My grandfather finished up with Balawa's ear, whipped out a belt and beat the shit out of Balawa. Then she beat the shit out of Mlungisi too. She didn't touch me. And uh, he finds out, uh, he gets asked why he didn't hit Trevor and he says, because I don't know how to hit a white child, she said. A black child, I understand. A black child, you hit them and they stay black. Trevor, when you hit him, he turns blue and green and yellow and red. I've never seen those colours before. I'm scared I'm going to break him. I don't want to kill a white person. I'm so afraid I'm not going to touch him. And she never did. And he sort of talks about how that makes him feel because obviously he knows that it's kind of wrong but also he accepts it because he knows that it makes his life easier which is what tends to happen in a racist society. You know, there's like inadvertent racism and systemic racism and stuff. He says here, what happened with education in South Africa with the mission schools and the Bantu schools offers a neat comparison of the two groups of whites who oppressed us, the British and the Afrikaners. The difference between British racism, the difference between British racism and Afrikaner racism was that at least the British gave the natives something to aspire to. If they could learn to speak correct English and dress in proper clothes, if they could anglicize and civilize themselves, one day they might be welcome in society. The Afrikaners never gave us that option. British racism said, if the monkey can walk like a man and talk like a man, then perhaps he is a man. Afrikaner racism said, why give a book to a monkey? This amused me. This is the kind of thing my mum used to do as well. We always wore second-hand clothes from charity shops or that were giveaways from white people at church. All the other kids at school got brands, Nike and Adidas. I never got brands. One time I asked my mum for Adidas sneakers. She came home with some knockoff brand, Abidas. Mum, these are fake, I said. I don't see the difference. Look at the logo, there are four stripes instead of three. Look at you, she said. You got one extra. And this, uh, here he compares apartheid to Catholic schools, he said. Catholic school is similar to apartheid in that it's ruthlessly authoritarian and its authority rests on a bunch of rules that don't make any sense. My mother grew up with these rules and she questioned them. When they didn't hold up, she simply went around them. The only authority my mother recognised was God's. God is love and the Bible is truth. Everything else was up for debate. She told me to challenge authority and question the system. The only way it backfired on her was that I constantly challenged and questioned her. So this made me a bit sad. It's um, the attitude towards uh, cats. It says, I grew up in a black family in a black neighborhood in a black country with white rules. I've traveled to other black cities and black countries all over the black continent. And in all that time, I've yet to find a place where black people like cats. One of the biggest reasons for that, as we know in South Africa, is that only witches have cats and all cats are witches. There was, an infamous incident during an Orla there was an infamous incident during an Orlando Pirates against Kaiser Chiefs soccer match a few years ago. A cat got into the stadium and ran through the crowd and out onto the pitch in the middle of the game. A security guard, seeing the cat, did what any sensible black person would do. He said to himself, that cat is a witch. He caught the cat and, live on TV, he kicked it and stomped it and beat it to death with a shambok. It was front page news all over the country. White people lost their shit. Oh my word, it was insane. The security guard was arrested and put on trial and found guilty of animal abuse. He had to pay some enormous fine to avoid spending several months in jail. What was ironic to me was that white people had spent years seeing video footage of black people being beaten to death by other white people. But this one video of a black man kicking a cat, that's what sent them over the edge. Black people were just confused. They didn't see any problem with what the man did. They were like, obviously that cat was a witch. How else would a cat know how to get onto a soccer pitch? Somebody sent it to jinx one of the teams. That man had to kill the cat. He was protecting the players. In South Africa, black people have dogs. He talks about his father here and his dad. He says, that one thing I do know about my dad is that he hates racism and homogeneity more than anything, and not because of any feelings of self-righteousness or moral superiority. He's just never understood how white people could be racist in South Africa. Africa is full of black people, he would say. So why would you come all the way to Africa if you hate black people? 
If you hate black people so much, why did you move into their house? To him, it's insane. And I think this is interesting too, because it's spot on as well. The animosity I felt from the animosity I felt from the coloured people I encountered growing up was one of the hardest things I've ever had to deal with. It taught me that it is easier to be an insider as an outsider than to be an outsider as an insider. If a white guy chooses to immerse himself in hip-hop culture and only hangs out with black people, black people will say, cool white guy, do what you need to do. If a black guy chooses to button up his blackness to live among white people and play lots of golf, white people will say, fine, I like Brian, he's safe. But try being a black person who immerses himself in white culture while still living in the black community. Try being a white person who adopts the trappings of black culture while still living in the white community. You will face more hate and ridicule and ostracism than you can even begin to fathom. People are willing to accept you if they see you as an outsider trying to assimilate into their world. But when they see you as a fellow tribe member attempting, disav attempting to disavow the tribe, that is something they will never forgive. That is what happened to me in Eden Park. And uh, this speaks to kind of how, how hard up they were for money. Like food, petrol for the car was an expense we could not avoid, but my mum could get more but my mum could get more mileage out of a tank of petrol than any human who has ever been on a But my mum could get more mileage out of a tank of petrol than any human who has ever been on a road in the history of automobiles. She knew every trick. Driving around Johannesburg in our rusty old beetle, every time she stopped in traffic, she'd turn off the car. Then the traffic would start and she'd turn the car on again. That stop start technology that they use in hybrid cars now. That was my mum. She was a hybrid car before hybrid cars came out. She was the master of coasting. She knew every downhill between work and school, between school and home. She knew exactly where the gradient shifted to put it into neutral. She could time the robots so we could coast through intersections without using the brakes or losing momentum. There were times when we'd be in traffic and we had so little money for petrol that I would have to push the car. If we were stuck in a traffic jam, my, my mum would turn the car off and it was my job to get out and push it forward six inches at a time. People would pitch up, people would pitch up and offer to help. Are you stuck? Nope, we're fine. You sure? Yep. Can we help you? Nope. Do you need a tow? And what do you say? The truth? Thanks, but we're just so poor my mum makes her kid push the car. This here is very true as well. And it's quite interesting because he was talking about like making pirated CDs and stuff and getting a CD burner. And I remember those days, although I never made pirated CDs myself. Well, I did. I just never sold them for profit. I made them for personal pleasure. People love to say, give a man a fish and he'll eat for a day. Teach a man to fish and he'll eat for a lifetime. What they don't say is, and it would be nice if you gave him a fishing rod. That's the part of the analogy that's missing. Working with Andrew was the first time in my life I realised you need someone from the privileged world to come to you and say, okay, here's what you need and here's how it works. Talent alone would have gotten me nowhere without Andrew giving me the CD writer. People say, oh, that's a handout. No, I still have to work to profit by it but I don't stand a chance without it. And so he says here, uh, the unemployment rate, technically speaking, was lower in South Africa during apartheid, which makes sense. There was slavery. That's how everyone was employed. When democracy came, everyone had to be paid a minimum wage. The cost of labor went up and suddenly millions of people were out of work. The unemployment rate for young black men post apartheid shot up, sometimes as high as 50%. What happens to a lot of guys is they finish high school and they can't afford university and even little retail jobs can be hard to come by when you're from the hood and you look and talk a certain way. So for many young men in South Africa's townships, freedom looks like this. Every morning they wake up, maybe their parents go to work or maybe not. Then they go outside and chill on the corner the whole day talking shit. They're free, they've been taught how to fish, but no one will give them a fishing rod. He says here he spent a little bit of time in a jail as well um, and he says, that's what happened my entire life. Coloured people would see me hanging out with blacks and they'd confront me, want to fight me. I saw myself starting a race war in the holding cell. Hey, why are you hanging out with the blacks? Because I am black. No, you're not, you're coloured. Ah, yes, I know it looks that way, friend, but let me explain. It's a funny story, actually. My father is white and my mother is black and race is a social construct, so that wasn't gonna work, not here. He talks about his stepfather here and how people can be kind of deceitful. He says, I liked him too. A.B. was charming and hilarious and had an easy, gracious smile. He loved helping people too, especially anyone in distress. If someone's car broke down on the freeway, he pulled over to see what he could do. If someone yelled, stop, thief, he was the guy who gave chase. The old lady next door needed help moving boxes. He's that guy. He liked to be liked by the world, which made his abuse even harder to deal with. Because if you think someone is a monster and the whole world says he's a saint, you begin to think that you're the bad person. It must be my fault this is happening is the only conclusion you can draw because why are you the only one receiving his wrath? So yeah, um, all in all, I pretty much enjoyed this one. Um, I thought it was interesting because in a way, anybody could have written it, but in another way, it had to be Trevor Noah because 
it had to be someone with his own sort of racial background, I guess, and, he, you know, he was quite rare. He was literally born a crime. It doesn't go too much into his, like, comedy career or anything like that, um, but I'm not necessarily a huge fan of his. I also d disagree with some of his views um, towards animals, but hey-ho. But um, overall, I did enjoy it. I'd give it a four out of five, and it's um, one to read if you're interested in, you know, apartheid and how people can be shitty towards each other. So there we have it, that's what I made of A Born a Crime by Trevor Noah. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you've read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit subscribe for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.